I'm Brad Rabinowitz. I'm the president of the Frog Hollow Board, and I'm thinking that introducing Bob Compton to a room full of potters is sort of a silly task, but <laughs> I'm supposed to be doing it, so I'm going to do it. I've actually known Bob for 35 or yeah, too long. 40 years, yeah. maybe. I don't know. <laughs> and I watched him build his kilns and stuff on the hillside there in Bristol, and it's fun to watch. Um, but we're very excited by this kind of exhibit. Having Bob's exhibit here is just a treat. You know, it's the kind of thing we've been wanting to do more of, and, and this to us is a very exciting show, and, and the response to it has been great. But I do want to thank some people that we have some sponsors, VPR, Outdoor Gear Exchange. They've really donated the space to us for the, for the month, and that's great. Um, RETN is doing the um, filming and documentation of it, and it will be available online on TV at some point. Do we know when? You can go online and find out when it's on there, too. Um, and we have a patron sponsor, uh, Fulton Gregg, who actually was at UVM with Bob also a few years ago. Um, and this is the second lecture that Bob is doing. Um, and we do, again, have barely enough chairs. Um, the Working Potter. Um, and we, there's one more, which is next 21st. Is that Tuesday? Yeah. Uh, no, it's a week from today. A week from today. Yeah. And so on kilns, just kilns. Is that the wrong date then? That's the wrong date. Oh, yeah, well, good, that's interesting. But it's next, th next, <laughs> next Thursday, a week from next today. Next Thursday, yes. The Potter's Kiln, which... Well, that's interesting, the wrong date. We'll, we'll figure that one out. We'll figure that yeah. one out. Okay. But it is. Yeah, and, um, and actually, it's, it's, it's just kilns in general. I'm, a, well, I'm gonna let Bob he's take an architect, over from there. and I sort of am a wannabe kiln architect. Well, so I have, well you're a kiln architect. I mean, <laughs> They are wonderful constructions. Yeah. And the other thing I was going to mention is there's a, a guest book over there. And when you sign in, if you can put your email address on, that would be great. Bob will send out announcements of when you have wood well, firing. Yeah, everybody's invited to wood firing in my studio. If you just give me an address, we'll drop you a note. There's been some stokers okay. here already, so. Um, it's all yours. OK, well, cool. Um, so uh, I, I'm, uh, I've got a lot of images. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of image driven as a person as most potters are. So I'm going to go through this really fast. But the, the basic topics on this one were going to, was more about techniques than it was about my history as a potter or anything else I've been doing and how things have, have changed. So I'm going to do something on wheels, on the forming processes that I've gone through. Um, a little bit on business that seems to be the least important thing to most people, but I my life is about business, and, and I, I tend to ramble on, but I limit it to something very small. And at the very end of it is just kind of how the, the kilns I'm using how, are affecting uh, the surface qualities of what, what um, my work is today. So we're off and running. Uh, and that's the younger version. That was my kid brother, by the way. <laughs> um, so I started out back in 71. I built a, a, a kick, kick wheel. You know, with a 150-pound flywheel, bigger is better, right? Of uh, if anybody's had a big flywheel, you know that, that that's kind of crazy. And I, I used that for a short period of time. Moved over to a Shimpo, which was my, my one wheel for many, many, many years. Um, it's sort of an industrial wheel that was made in Japan. Um, used it a lot. Um, but the positioning of it, squatting down, being bent over, is pretty hard on the back. Um, this is taken actually in New Zealand, but there's a, a leech wheel. And if anybody knows what leech wheels are, they're a sit-down wheel where you treadle, sort of like a treadle sewing machine. One foot is in constant motion, unlike a momentum wheel where you kick a big heavy stone and have it fly and slow down. This one, you always have one foot in motion. It actually happens to my left foot. You can't see it there, but that's, that's the leech wheel. Um, I mean, on Chris's my last trip to New Zealand, we've been there like five times. Somebody gave me a leech wheel. No, they, nobody wants to use them over there anymore. And pardon? And no, nobody wants to use the leech wheel over there anymore. So somebody gave me one. I bought another one for 50 bucks, and we shipped them back on a boat. Uh, so I have one in my studio for illogical reasons because it hurts my back to throw on it. Um, this is for early UVM. Tim McCosker might even remember this guy, uh, where we attached you know a wheel to the ceiling so you could elongate forms. But there's all kinds of different ways of throwing. 
and I had to figure out ways that wouldn't hurt my back so bad. Uh, in 84, I got so bad I couldn't throw at all, and I moved into slip casting, which I'll get into a little bit later on, and that's what the water sculpture sort of evolved out of. So I started out on, on an alpine that I borrowed from Bob Green, actually, put it on cinder blocks, and moved the seat up higher, so at least I would be upright, but he still had to bend up the waist for me to get over the weight of the clay, and that's where a lot of lower back pain comes from. And anybody who's potted for any amount of time usually ends up with potter's back, and that's a real nuisance. Um, so this is sort of the ultimate wheel for me now. It happened, oh, sorry guys. It happens to be a um, Pacifica wheel that I've made a, a platform up so when I sit, I tilt the whole seat forward, puts my body over the wheel head, my legs are elongated, and I kind of have about a third of my weight on my butt and the rest of it on my legs. I have no back pain now. I can throw virtually indefinitely without any issues now. And after casting for about seven years because I couldn't throw, this brought me back to being able to throw as a potter. I, 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 didn't, I left out about 10 photographs of potters I, we visited. A lot of industrial potters throw standing up. I mean, well, most of the ones we met in England and a lot of the ones we met in North Carolina threw standing up because you know, they didn't want to have the back issues. But I find that hard on, on my feet. So um, uh, this was, I was, hmm, I was a, um, a guest speaker at the New Zealand Society of Potters Conference, which is sort of like NSICA over there. And you can see we kind of improvised the same wheel. I blocked, put a, cinder, a, a two by four with some duct tape on the back of the chair, raised it up on cinder blocks, and was able to sort of keep my back straight and my pelvis tilted. Big key if you're a potter and you're really having back problems, it's possible to pot with a bad back as long as you can kind of get your body into an ergonomic position. Uh, that's a real, real major thing for me. Um, and one quick thing on tools, and, and the newer wheels that are being put out now kind of take this into account. But I made up a little uh, uh, double-tiered uh, platform that, that sits in my uh, splash bucket. It has a little recessed area so it won't fall out. And you can see in the right, I'm giving a workshop up in Canada, how all my tools are accessible. So I don't have floating sponges and needle tools and all kinds of daggers inside my water bucket that I can cut my hand on. And, and find things on. I always leave them out there, but it's a little hint. This whole kind of talk I'm trying to do tonight is more direct, directed toward potters and things that might be find helpful in, in maybe running your studio a little differently. Um, so clays and clay bodies. Uh, for, for, for those of us who come out of the 60s, we pretty much all made up our own clays. Um, and actually the Vermont K Kale and Company, which that's a sign in my house, uh, is from a kale and mine six miles from me on Horse Gravel Road, uh, which operated into the mid 60s. But basically, in the, in the 70s, early 80s, everybody made their own clay up. And uh, you could buy clay from Eastern Refractories, which is a company here in Vermont that used to fix boilers, which again, don't kind of made the way they used to be made. And you could buy clay for like a penny a pound and no shipping costs. So uh, it was really handy to be able to mix up your own clay in, the, in that time period. I now have sold all my machinery, pretty much, and I have uh, uh, Sheffield down in Massachusetts make up my clay bodies for me. But, this, but for having said that, I'll give you a quick run through on, on what we used to do. And uh, that was the industrial dough mixer that I used for many years for mixing clay. I'd blend a variety of four or five different clays together, put it in, uh, dry blend it, add water, come out as a paste, um, I would stack up piles of clay in about a thousand pound bins that would age for about a month. Clay gets more elastic with time. I don't know how much you or potters or even care, but clay is a plate-like particle. It's, it, and those plate-like particles slide past each other. And it, even if you add water to clay, it takes a while for that water to percolate between those clay particles. So sometimes if you mix up clay and it feels nice and soft, and then a month later, it feels harder. It's not that it lost moisture. It's that it finally percolated through and got between those clay particles. So oftentimes when you're buying clay from a clay manufacturer, you might ask to have it made softer than you really want it if it's going to sit around for any period of time because it will actually harden in the bag. So what I was doing was block wedging. I would take like 100 pounds of clay, cut it in half. This was a George Scatchard thing, uh, as John can attest to. Uh, 
Uh, you cut, cut it in half, slam the clay down. Now you have two layers. And by doing that about 20 times, you end up with over a million layers, two, four, eight, 16, 32. It kind of goes on and on that way. And um, so you cut it in half, flip it upside down to, to flatten it, cut it again, cut it again, cut it again. So a lot of early work for me was just grunt physical work of, of uh, wedging clay, getting prepped for, in that time period, this would have been like 1974 uh, when I was doing aquariums. So a, a quick run through on throwing aquariums. I don't do this anymore. I didn't know, you know, my background, as many of you know, I went to ag school rather than art school. So my background wasn't in throwing. George Scatcher was my mentor and that's how I sort of learned to throw. And George didn't really throw big pots in the shop very much. So I just assumed you put a lot of clay on the wheel head and you and you threw it. And it was years later before I figured out there's easier ways to that. But this was, this was a real quick process of throwing that aquarium. I'd stand on the clay, I'd work it out with my heels to get sort of well centered, and then uh, stretch it out into a ring, pull the ring up into a vertical wall, it's going on its own again. Um, I get that up and then drop in the rim on the right to, so it'll be parallel with the wheel head. Um, so later on, I could then put glass into the chamber. And this was a standing aquarium. So I put feet on the bottom, use a level, use a level to make sure that when it was all stood up, it wouldn't be tipping one way or the other. And I carved the feet down in order to get them to have a nice taper to the form. And uh, this kind of gets into where I was never much of a glazer. So I made up tools that would, uh, be my surface treatment. And in this case, I had made up a, a clay mallet, which had a piece of coral attached to the end of it. And I would, you see in the upper left, I'd beat the whole surface after I got the neck and the feet on, and I'd have a textured surface. The same thing that's on the aquariums that, that's in the, in the booth over there right now. Um, so that hammerhead was what, what I used for texturing, and that was the 15 gallon aquarium and then we moved on to doing hanging aquariums, which became my main focus. There's gotta be a way of stopping this, I'm so sorry. Um, so basically now I do a coil and throw technique. And the, the principle for this really is, for those of you who've done big pots, is you really wanna dry the pot as you go so it can support the weight. You add a coil of clay to that, and then you can stretch that coil up. It's actually easier to throw big pots than it is to try to put 25 pounds of clay on the wheel and try to throw something this big. I mean, these larger pieces are much, much easier to work with. Um, and one of the reasons was using torches. This happens to be a weed burner you can get in a hardware store. Uh, I, I used a glass blower as a kneeling torch, actually, which works really nice. They have a plastic handle and they're a little more delicate. Um, but either one of them works. And the idea is to get enough moisture out of the clay that it can stand the weight of more uh, clay added to the top of it, but not so much dryness that the moisture content has changed to where it won't adjust well. And you can see it, I hate to show it to you, but you can see it on one of my pots in the window where the form kind of goes and then it goes in. And when I made it, it was a perfectly even form, but it over dried that area. So when I put the next coil on and that dried in, it kind of came in a, a bit more of an angle. Um, Connie Talbot, who's a potter in Southern uh, Massachusetts came up and we were both doing that. You can see she's using actually one of those annealers tortures and I'm adding coils to, to one of those forms there. So, and we, get, we gave workshops. I talked about this in the last workshop a little bit. Um, to make a living as a potter, you kind of always figuring out new ways of doing things. Um, making big pots, well, we did as a workshop technique because it's something that most people just aren't familiar with. They don't have the equipment or the tools to do it with. So we often did that and people would take their greenware pots home with them. That's actually our former apprentice Brian put it in somebody's convertible. And there's a, some of the forms that, that are actually one or two of them are right here in the house. So most of what I'm doing now is about texturing, um, throwing and texturing. And um, again, my inclination isn't to do brushwork, and it's not because I don't like brushwork, it's just I've never had a, a, a skill level developed in that. And uh, I do a, a bit of altering of forms, I'm not gonna show much of that on the bottom where I throw forms and then stretch the bottoms out, but a lot of what I'm doing now has to do with, with uh, 
rope rolling, which is called uh, jomon. Jomon means cord press. It's a Japanese technique that was used where rope was pressed into the clay. And I'll run through a quick series of, of uh, throwing a jomon plate. I'm using plaster bats, which, which don't warp, which is, I, I use wooden bats for years. Most of us in the early days used sink cutouts out of particle board because they were cheap and everything else, but boy, some of the newer materials work really well. So I use plaster bats, I'd wet it. I always keep a wet towel and a wet dirty towel handy for me. This is just another work process thing I think that potters might find helpful. Rather than having a dry towel with you all the time, if you have a damp towel, it's easier to keep your hands clean in between operations. So I'm quickly going to throw about five pounds of clay for a, a, a Jomon plate. I'll, I'll stretch it across the piece, use um, any of the slop clay that comes off. I put it right back in the plastic bag that I'm now getting from Sheffield. So I, I keep my whole work area clean the way I'm, I'm working these days. Um, use these, uh, a rib just to smooth it out so I have a perfectly smooth surface before I start. And then I'm taking basically a piece of rope here, you can see here on the left, wetting it and then just rolling that all the way across. I'm leaving my plates a little extra thick because between wire cutting them off and some of the ones I trim, you really have to start with a lot more clay than you, you would suspect you'd need. So basically, I, I texture the whole plate. I'm not even thinking about edges. I just do the whole thing all the way from, from one surface to the other, and then I'll, I'll draw up the uh, edges of the plate and use a pair of calibers to make sure the diameter is correct. And, uh, hey Michelle. And also the inside diameter. So we can actually have stacking plates for, for what that's worth. Uh, I, I prefer just to make pieces one at a time, but people do like to have stacking plates. Um, so I'll, I will usually run a, or do a run of 25 or 40 plates at a time, and then dry them, and then run them through the process. Um, and that's basically essentially what that Jomon cord looks like. You know. After we've rope rolled it, there's actually kind of a rough, high, shiny edge on it, which I didn't learn until after I fired about 50 plates that went on my dump, uh, because it's a little too sharp. So I would rope, rope roll the whole thing when it was when it was hard leather, hard, not almost dry. I would sand it with a, with a Scotch Brite pad just to get the high points off, and then using a Celadon glaze. The glaze will fill in the valleys and it'll read as a pattern. You run your hand over the plate; it almost feels perfectly smooth, but it's actually just getting that color variation from the texture. And then that's where texture became a big part of my life. Uh, I started doing it on vertical forms, uh, and I'll show you the tools that we use for doing most of the different kinds of uh, Jomon. We don't have a lot of them out here, but uh, our little Unomis and, and uh, uh, keepsake jars. This is a little kimono cord that somebody sent me from Japan, and I rolled that, actually just did that this morning. I rolled that out on a little piece of clay to show you what the texture is like, and then what it reads like on the finished pot. Um, that one is actually one of those pull chains you get on from a light cord. I wrapped it around a piece of uh, plastic pipe, made sure the ends were taped shut, and then rolled that all over the surface of the piece on the right. And again, you get kind of a beaded surface. The interesting thing about using that is you're doing a raised surface. Most of the Jomon stuff I'm doing, you're, you're leaving a, a dent rather than raising it. And, the, and the, the chain was an interesting kind of uh, uh, yin to the yang of one being up and one being down. Um, I also found that while rope was an interesting feature, you can really only apply a certain amount of it to, to a round form. So I've made up very short logs. They're about an inch and a half long, and I've probably made 150 of these things up. And I'll take any kind of a tool with them, you know, pencil eraser, or, uh, you know, screw head, anything at all. Make hundreds of different little textures on these things. Throw away about 95% of them because they're really ugly. Uh, uh, but end up with some that really work pretty well. And one of the keys, if you're a potter and you're doing this, is to taper the ends so that when you're rolling them, you're not getting the end of that piece of uh, bisque clay uh, to, to give a pattern. Uh, so that's one of the little tricks to the Jomon technique. There again is the Jomon technique uh, on that or a short uh, bisque piece of clay that has that texture and then rolled over a piece that was salt glazed. It's subtle but it's so much different than not having it on there at all. 
and this was one actually when, it, when I was in England a few years ago, we visited with a potter. Actually, a potter came over for dinner at a place I was giving a workshop by the name of Phil Rogers, who's a pretty well-known saw glaze potter. And when we stopped by his studio, he was using the core of an old metal pencil sharpener. And he took that out, put it on, yeah, he was, I don't know, he had a little wooden stick, but I basically took a coat hanger and made a handle out of it. And that won't work worth a damn on soft clay because it's goops right up. But when the clay's leather hard, you can roll it up and down, and then you get that kind of a patterning line. A very subtle surface, but really an interesting one. Um, butter paddles. Um, you, you find them in antique stores, and I thought that was the way to go for getting the texture that you see on the handle of this. So I basically, I rolled out a, 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 a clay log, tapered the ends of it, which is what the handle of on the surface that I do is, but I want the t texture to be more interesting than just the surface of the pot. And um, I found uh, these uh, butter paddles work pretty well, but what works even better is floor mats. You can get them at, <laughs> at Home Depot, they're rubber mats, and they're flexible. So you can actually get two pieces of it, roll it between them, and you get these wonderful textures. So some of the simplest tools are the cheapest ones you can possibly find. And these are just a couple of the different texturing patterns that, that we use on our work. And um, so much more of my time now is spent texturing a pot than it is throwing it, especially you know me, so I can throw them in, in seconds. But it'll take me minutes before I can get them all textured properly. Um, and then we get into wire cutting. I'm assuming a lot of people have used cheese cutters. It's pretty classic. Um, but I took the wire off of this cheese cutter, kind of ran it around a, a piece of, a, a, actually it was a, a pencil, and then stretched that out and got kinks in it. And then when I threw a form, I could drag that up and it gave me a variety of different depths on the form. So that was another way of using uh, uh, basically a straight-sided cylinder uh, and having an awful lot of visual information given to you. So I have three different things going on here. A straight wall, or basically the classic way you buy a cheese cutter, the one with a really heavy cording I showed you before. This one had just a little tiny bit of texture. You hardly even notice it. But if you look at the pot I'm, I'm working on on the right there, I did one cut with that texture and I sawed it. Rather than pulling it straight up, you did a saw pattern. And that gives you a whole other visual look to the surface. And then I'd alternate, alternate that with a, with a straight one, and then a sawed one, then a straight one. And you had to count right because otherwise you ended up with two or the other. Um, and then w here's another variation on the same form. I'm using a, uh, I saw more or less of a straight walled cylinder. I uh, used a cheese cutter that was straight sided and I cut it a little bit more of at an angle so it wasn't quite straight sided. But then using my hand on the inside you could swell the form. So you don't end up with these really rigid exterior forms. You can have the form swell in multiple directions and that's what's going on in, on the uh, uh, image on the right. Um, potter's chop. Um, I, I kind of thrown this one in here because I'm making my potter's chops out of bisque ware, or well, basically a clay log, and I'm making up what's the stylization of my water sculptures. And I make them up in a variety of about three different sizes depending upon the pot. I, I want to put them on I mean, little tiny yonomis, but I also want to put them on large vessels. Uh, it's become my mark, and that's not like a big deal, but it's, since I'm not a decorator, it's one more thing that people look at for uh, uh, information as to who did the, the piece. In the 1970s, if you look at the plates that are in that booth from the 1970s, it says Robert Compton, Bristol, Vermont, actually Moortown, Vermont, where I started, 1972. It has everything but my phone number, you know I mean? I, I wanted people to know how to find me. That was a big deal. I was trying to make a living. I wanted people to get back in touch with me. As I've gotten sort of a little older and, and the, the, the pop has more meaning to me, I, I'm more interested in the surface being the dominant uh, aspect of what people see. And, I don't wear Coca-Cola t-shirts either. So it's the same kind of an idea. I have my chop, which is on my pot, but I also, later on, you'll see I sign the pieces in very inconspicuous ways. So this is a whole variation on that wire cut. Uh, uh, the same wire cut form where I swelled it, swelled it more uh, extremely on the lower uh, left, uh, uh, and then would pull in the rims to do these keepsake jars. Um, again, the same wire cut with the, with the kinks in it, but without sawing, with the bottom, bottom left, 
I gave a little bit of a saw pattern to. The, the upper one was straight. The other one was just a straight sided uh, 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 cheese cutter with no, no kinks in it at all. Um, the, the, the thing you'll have to figure out on your own, and it, and it always varies, and we, we lose a certain number of them, is how thick to leave the clay. You really gotta leave a lot of thick clay in order to take off a chunk that big. And of course, when the pot gets very big, you really can't hardly do it. I mean, your, your cuts have to be pretty small, otherwise you're cutting through the form. So, you know, going out to about four or five inch diameter and leaving the pot pretty thick, you can get a lot of visual information this way. And I do it also on bowls. There's some bowl forms here where I'll throw the bowls round, leave them thick enough that I can come back through and do wire cuts on the outsides of those. Um, I did get into a, a short period, and it, it lasted about a year and a half, where I would actually throw pieces on the wheel, and then while they're still on the wheel, uh, actually cut them free on the bottom, and then push out the outside edges of the form, and then square up roughly as much as I could while it's still wet on the wheel. They looked really amorphous at that point. But then you have to wait until they stiffen up a little bit, then you can come back and kind of crisp up those edges. And in my case, then I could come back and I could cut out and kind of you know, imply feet and, and areas on the bottoms of these. So there was a little period in the, in the 19, pretty much the uh, 1990s where I was exploring all kinds of new forms, some which worked out real well and some were a whole lot less successful. This became sort of one of the trademark pieces, was a real simple form to do, but uh, basically taking the edge of a Kempler, square edged uh, trim tool, and then cutting facets down through the form and not cutting all the way through if possible. Uh, although having done that many times, I found that patching them made it more interesting. It's almost like there was more story to it once you put a patch on it. Um, but that's, that's what that was. And then saw glazing really tends to really work well with, the, with, with that extra texture because you have these little valleys where the salt's gonna kind of miss the, the, the low area and then hit up on the edges. So there are much, you know, I do some of these in, in my gas kiln uh, because the gas firings are so much more successful. We have 95% you know, success rate firing pots in the gas kiln. In the wood kiln, uh, which I have up to 1,500 pieces in, you know, we may only end up with, uh, you know, 20% that are really pretty nice pots and another 25% that are there are real soluble. And then a whole bunch of others you've got to figure out what to do with. Uh, you refire them, you try to refire them, or you do whatever you're going to do. A lot of them end up on the dump. Uh, but uh, these I pretty much save for the salt, salt firing process. Uh, a couple more variations on those. But they're all thrown round initially. Again, from a potter standpoint, they're all thrown round initially. And then uh, I will trim, I'll flip it upside down, trim the foot out, and I'll leave two guide marks, top and bottom, because you gotta know where to start and where to stop that cutting process. Uh, it's a real joke if you don't, because you know they end up just looking like this amorphous, bunch of cuts on the side of a pot. So uh, they, those deep lines in here uh, are not just visual lines for effect, they also really give you a starting and a stopping point. Um, another, again, altering forms was, was something I really kind of worked at through the um, you know, early 2000s, late 1990s. Uh, I was kind of getting out of the water sculpture business and I did a lot of forms that I liked a lot as, as pot forms. Um, this is a thrown form altered. I cut away where the handle was going to be. Did one of those rolled, ro uh, rolled coils where I kind of had that texture like I showed you on our servers. And I put a small coil in to fill in that gap and then put a larger coil over that. So it kind of gave some visual weight. I, I see a lot of pot potters make pots they cut out for a handle but it ends up being the weak spot rather than the strong spot on the piece. Um, I loved making these pieces, but boy, when you put a time analysis to them, um, I'm not making them anymore right now. Um, in fact, there's like one platter on the wall there that, that I'm, I'm asking, you know, your, your second born child's, you know, uh, cost for, because it's one of the only few that I can ever get out of it. Cutting the form this way to create that handle weakens the structure. I mean, you've, you've basically taken what was a relatively strong form, a circle, you've cut that out, 
and then when you're putting the handle on top, you oftentimes end up with splits and twists and, and warping processes that go through that. So um, again, a, a period of time where, and there's a number of those shown around here that uh, I, I've done, and I'll, I'll go back to it someday. One of the reasons a lot of the pieces in the, in the exhibit area of, of my older work I'm not selling is just to remind myself that I really need to go back to that someday. Um, so I'll go a quick thing on, we're talking about processes and techniques. And I, I kind of showed you, I, 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 when I was younger at least, I could throw big pots and I could throw it in one piece. Uh, I can still throw big pots now, but I do it with coil and throw techniques and they're a lot easier on me and, and the pots are a lot better. But back in, this was like around 1983-ish, I guess, I would throw uh, a, uh, what would become the red fountain that you see behind the screen there. I would throw a form, throw a separate uh, stem for it, join the two pieces together, flip them upside down, and then add little nipples, kind of like cow tits, on the bottom sides of them. And I'd scrape a texture through the whole thing to try to blend those two forms together. And these were a series of the hand-thrown forms that uh, I did up until about 1984. Uh, that's when I started having some back problems, and again, learning how to throw standing up solved most of that. But it really wasn't unusual for me to throw a thousand pounds of clay in a day. And that was, wasn't a big deal. It was just that you had to throw a lot of rough forms in order to um, uh, cut away sections, add sections. Uh, and I, I might throw a thousand pounds of clay, but only end up with 550 pounds of pots once you got away from all the different pieces that you cut out of it. And that was even more so with, with this design fountain. And the one on the very far right uh, uh, was made in 1976, and that was all hand-thrown forms. But you can see the upper part of that was a bowl form. I took, cut diagonally with a wire, threw a separate stem, added them together, and then hand-shaped the edges and tried to get the spout so that it would match up with the one below. And even using uh, calibers, it never quite worked just the way you wanted. So you, you, you'd make you know, 15 of one shape and then you try to mix and match and hopefully get some that would actually work together. Uh, so this is a whole series of those early thrown forms. And like I say, that was a big bowl form, cut diagonally, half of it was thrown away and recycled and then uh, uh, added to a stem. That was the base tier of those forms. That led into casting. And I don't know if anybody in here is casting these days. Um, Bill Bowman is. And Bill, was, Bill became the caster uh, of the area. Uh, but when I had back problems and I thought I was going to have to stop throwing, I had molds made up in Canada, up in uh, Fredericksburg, that was the town, uh, by um, James Ewing, who was a mold maker up there. So I took him up a model of one of these forms, and then he made uh, the very first uh, molds for me. And I, I might as well have gone into bronze casting. There was no similarity uh, between working wet clay and throwing on a wheel, and then pouring cl liquid clay into these plaster negatives and hoping to get something out of them. But it worked for us. Um, so I, you can see here, I would have all those on that one table was exactly the same tier, like number tier, and I would cast like 10 pounds at a time. Um, I'd make up about 400 gallons of slip, pump it all in in one day, and then uh, I'm, at the right I'm taking one of the molds apart after I had cast it. And this was the system that I used. George Scatcher uses, I, he was using gravity, wasn't he? He had, a, he, had, he put all, did all his, mixed all his clays upstairs and then used gravity to run it downstairs with. I didn't have that option. So I'm using a, a pump, using compressed air, and I connected five different tanks together. And using a whole series of valves, I could run slip from one tank to the other, pump it into the molds, which essentially is what I'm, I'm doing here. Actually, I'm taking it out of this one. So I'm pumping from a, uh, from a 500 gallon tank, I'm filling this, uh, basically the basin, is what one of those forms are, with liquid clay. And because I'm working with porcelain and uh, kind of learning as I went, to, to get the thickness I needed, the slip would have to sit in here for like nine hours uh, before I could drain it out in order to get the thickness I needed. So, uh, and this would be a real bear to try to get the slip out of by dumping it. So I could actually reverse the pumps 
and then suck the slip back out again. So I, I would make a separate tube, which is where the electrical cord underneath these base tiers goes out and down and is hidden so you don't see the cord going out. I was adding it on the right there into the basin of, of a mold I had just drained because you want to get the moisture contents just right. Uh, at that point, I'd let them stiffen up enough that I could put a board on top, strap a board, the equivalent of basically taking a bowl for and putting a, you know, a bat top and bottom and flipping it, but these were way too heavy to do that with. So I basically put a board on top of one of these uh, molds, strapped it on, had a chain fall I could hoist it up in the air with, flip it upside down, lower it with a chain fall, and then unstrap it, and then hoist it up, and then you had it on its rim. Um, uh, actually, I didn't do this. Uh, Joni's not here, is she? No, or Susan? Joni and Susan are both this big, and they did that. And actually, it, the, the piece itself only weighed about 35, 40 pounds, but it was all just a matter of leverage. Leverage is really kind of a cool thing. Um, so these are the bigger molds. And uh, again, I'm going to go through casting just because most potters don't cast. They want to be creative and make the one unique piece each time, but casting has wonderful virtues to it, even if it's just used as a rough form to start with. This is the base tier. What we're making is, is this form right there. And I'm doing, in the past, I would have thrown the top, cut the bowl diagonally, added it to a separate stem. Here, we're casting the whole form at one time. So that mold was filled with liquid clay. It sat there for about 11 hours. I drained it out. It's called a core, it's called a core and cast mold. Uh, in so much as where I take the top off defines the inside shape of the mold and then the, out, the bottom side of it, when I'm taking this part of it apart, is defining the thickness. So how long the clay sat in the mold determines how thick it was here. How thick this was was determined by how far apart this plaster was from the plaster on the other side. So it's called a a core cast or a drain cast mold. This is actually a combination of core and drain cast. Drain cast is a lot easier for people to use. And uh, that was uh, basically me lifting the piece out once it got leather hard enough to work with. And my life for about 10 years was making fountains. And I would you know, cast all these forms. I'd set them all up. Uh, run water through them for a day to make sure everything worked okay, there was no leaks, which virtually never was, and then we'd have to deal with packing and shipping them. So I had a copper rod that ran through them, which eventually turned into a stainless steel rod for uh, reasons of corrosion, and then uh, these were the forms that were being fired in my older gas kiln, and that's the kiln I'm standing in front of there. But you can see there's, there's a lot more refinement to this particular piece than the one on the very far right, which was all hand thrown. Um, and it's good or bad. I mean, in, in some respects, I like the one on the far right. There's, there's a little more earthiness to it, uh, but this has a sophistication that really worked well for us. Plus, I did the old Henry Ford thing of having interchangeable parts, where people could break tier number three and they could order one and they get one just like it. Uh, we once had a woman, well, about two or three years ago, a woman caught up. She bought one of our fountains that looks very much like the one on the far right. She'd broken a tear. She asked if I could remake it. I said, I'm sorry, you know, it, you, I made it 30 years ago. I don't, you work with the same clay. I don't work with the same kiln. My style's different. I, I just can't possibly do this. I can sell you a new fountain, at, at, you know, and then when we offered, you know, all this stuff. She ended up going to a curator of a museum who called me a week later to talk about it. Uh, he charged her, I think he charged her $2,200 to re-glue together and, and fix the missing parts for that one tier. She could have bought a whole fountain from me, you know, that was new, but it had a place in her heart. You know, we all get attached to something and she got attached to that one. Um, so, but while I was in the whole field, which was a, lasted about eight years of casting, I tried all kinds of different things. Uh, since I didn't have to work with cemetery anymore, clocks became a thing. There's not too many of them in here, but I had a whole series of different architectural kind of forms that were clocks. This one wall fountain that was running, we turned it off because it was kind of noisy when we're talking here, was the only one I ever made of that. I, I spent a lot of time, I got it all working just right. It didn't splash or anything else. But by the time I factored in what the woodworking was costing me, what 
what, what the other people who had to get their hands involved in this thing was, it was unaffordable to actually go into production with. So I've, I've designed lots of pieces that I've spent 150, 200 hours in on, and then you went, no, nah, ain't gonna work, move on to something else. Another clock, and, and that was actually a cast. Uh, when I got into casting, and I thought, well, I still continued to throw the aquariums by hand, even though I wasn't, um, uh, my back wasn't at its best, we developed a mold for casting uh, the aquarium. And that was a, a five piece mold, which became like, if you ever want to learn about mold making, uh, it's, it's, it's way more than you ever want to do. We cast a few of those and I found it much easier. Sometimes it's easier just to make them by hand. And then that, that's what that became. So in 1991, I sort of got out of casting. And those are the molds that until recent were just behind my house. Uh, that was basically taking everything out of the shop and getting me set up for going into uh, throwing again. Um, this is the real short business thing that I want to do. And, and afterwards, anybody wants to talk to me about it, fine. But it's a, it's a really ever-changing business to try to make a living at this. In the 60s uh, and the early 70s, going to craft shows was an incredibly successful and uh, lucrative thing to have done. I mean, I, I made a whole year's worth of income at one craft fair more than once. Uh, I mean, in, in, by today's standards, um, uh, adjusting for inflation, I, I could have gone to a craft fair and made fifty-five, sixty thousand dollars in sales. And uh, you talk to people who go to craft fairs today, and, and they're going, hmm, you know, if, can, if I can double my craft fair booth and do this, I'm doing really well. But um, things really changed. There was a proliferation of craft fairs. There's there's so many more to go to, and then the whole craft movement really exploded in the '60s, and uh, and and the early '70s, and and things changed. So. Um, I'm constantly changing, I mean, and, 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 and you can see it in this 40-year retrospective. You know, the water sculptures worked, or the fountain or aquariums worked for about 10 years really well for us. The water sculptures worked for about 10 years for us pretty well. I, I did this whole uh, exploration, and I'm going to get into that about firing forms, and I'm about like, more about process now than I hate to use the word novelty, but in a way, the aquariums were kind of a novelty piece. I mean, we had no trouble selling those. I was at craft fairs in the early 70s with people who were so well known, I won't even tell you their names because it's embarrassing. And I was like, there were people were five deep in front of my booth and they were walking past these really well known potters. And it was, and it was, it was a novelty piece I had. So it's nothing that I'm, I'm ashamed about, but you know, sometimes it's easier to be lucky and have something that nobody else is doing than it is to have another mug that's a little different than everybody else's mug because there's so many of them out there. Um, so that, again, was uh, my craft fair booth from the early 70s. That sign is actually the same sign you see there from 1972. I was at the Bennington Craft Fair. It was the last American Craft Council Fair held in Vermont before we moved to Rhineback. And uh, that was, uh, Vermont was where the American Craft Council had its very first craft fairs, which became a huge thing for um, the, the whole craft movement. Um, this kind of goes back to that whole chop thing, but um, using the chop, which is the only thing on a lot of pots, we have a number of Japanese friends who are potters and people who know Japanese history. And if you, like, uh, actually Jack Troy is a friend of ours, and he has a pot he knows is, if you've ever heard of Hamada, who's a very well-known uh, national treasure is worth this. This work is just worth tens of thousands of dollars, if not more than that. He never signed any of his pieces. He signed the box that the pots went into, the wooden box that they went into. So without the box, the pot has almost no value, and it's amazing. But that's just the way it is in Japan. So um, that's not America. So. Uh, I, I always put my chop on the pieces, and that's not going to ever, you know, people aren't going to know what that is. But people would ask me to come out with a magic marker and sign the bottom of my pots, which I really didn't want to do, but I did. Uh, but now I carve in small letters, as, as small as I can make it, and still have my name in them, because people do want to know who made the piece beyond what the chop is. Um, so anyway, craft fairs were what I did. I moved on to agents. I want to keep the business part really short. Uh, and, it's, and again, it's a dodging uh, uh, bullet for me to try to figure out where I'm going to be, you know, 
in the world of, of selling pots a few years from now. But we got out of doing craft fairs. We went to using art agents, which is like musicians have agents to find them uh, places to do gigs. Uh, and we used agents in the World Trade Centers in Chicago, LA, Frisco, and Dallas. And for about three or four years, we basically just stayed home and took orders. And we would get about 50 new stores every year, just staying at home, to have, answering the letters that came in from the stores that the art agents found for us. Now, you pay a price for that. I mean, if you have a, I'll make up the number, but if you have a thousand dollar pot and you sell it for 500, which is what the store gets for their normal cut, um, the agent got 20% of our end of it. So, you know, my 500 hours ended up being like 400 hours, right? Three. Oh, thank you, Chris. <laughs> I don't do math well. Uh, so, you know, so I, I get 300 hours for a pot that was retailing for a thousand. And actually, I just, I'll just extend this story a little bit because it is kind of a hoot. We, we ended up uh, selling to a Tokyo department store, which was our biggest account at one time. And they were buying basically about 22 fountains at a time. They wanted each one on a skid, which, you know, they wanted palletized because they were container freighting it and they're going to ship it over in their own containers from uh, LA. And uh, you know, we didn't have a forklift. We had two young women, plus Chris and I, trying to get these things from the back of a semi, and we shrink wrapped all this stuff, put it on the truck. I remember getting a check, I think the check was for like $3,800 for 22 skids of clay that went onto their truck. And then in theory, you know, it would, it would have been, you know, worth, you know, uh, well, 300 times that. It would have been worth like, you know, $9,000. We found out later that they were sold in Japan for $9,000 a piece. Uh, so I was getting $300 <laughs> for this piece that I was selling in Japan for nine retail. And I, I know there's shipping costs going overseas and all that, but it's, it's not something that I ever was angry about or, or irked about. You just got to deal with reality. If you weren't making money at 300 bucks, you shouldn't be doing it. And, and actually, it turned out we've heard that we weren't making money at 300 bucks, <laughs> and we stopped doing that. Um, you know, a lot of people actually will subsidize their wholesale work by their retail work. You know, they make you know, enough on their retail pots that when they go to a, a wholesale show and they're selling it up at half price, they think they're doing pretty good. But in reality, they're kind of subsidizing one with the other. You really kind of have to push all those numbers out in your head and find out where it all really works for you. And just another one little thing on, on business presence. Um, back in, this was 84, 85, Okay, whenever, my, my brain, Christine is over there. <laughs> and, there and she's actually sitting down there with Susan. Um, we had Becky Stainer, who, this is pre-digital pre photography. Becky Stainer came out, and she was charging $500 a day to do photography. So we made up movie sets, basically, for her to photograph. So this is the side of our house at the time. I put plywood up over the side of our house, and then we put clapboards up, which you can see there. Over, over top of that, and then we, we went to Horsford's nursery, and we did a deal with Horsford's to bring in a whole truckload of plants that we put on the walk here, and that photograph is that. Uh, so, um, you know, that's all part of getting, you know, the right imagery together. It's a lot easier to buy uh, an easy cube, which you can buy now, and put seamless paper in and have your pot floating in space. But for what we were doing, people needed to know where the pieces were going to be, what they look like in real settings. And we did a lot of indoor and outdoor photography. Um, and, that was, and that was at the time was that the catalog that we produced, we had like a 16 page color catalog on water sculptures. And uh, we sold lots of other things in the catalog, but in reality, we only sold fountains. But we would subliminally have photographs of the fountain like out on the deck. We're the, the photograph caption in the, in the catalog says moon lamps, which were something I cast, and slide clock at $65. But subliminally, we're just showing, hey, you can use a fountain here, you can use a fountain there. Um, but it was just all part of, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you get people to think about using work in different ways? So, you know, how do we make a living? This is the end of the whole talk on, on, on business stuff was um, we were advertising in fine gardening magazines for that catalog, which cost a fortune back when color separations and printing costs were huge. Um, and the, the, the ads we would run in a magazine were just to get people to, to ask for our catalog 
and we would ask for like two dollars for our catalog. Cost us three to three to print. Um, we asked for two dollars just so just so we wouldn't get these crowns. Like, please, Ken catalog, and you know it's a three-year-old who wrote it. You know, uh, we were just anyway to kind of limit that down a bit. But we were advertising in fine gardening, horticulture, landscape architecture magazines, and using reps at the same time. And we're using uh, our former catalog for that. And then in 1991, uh, we had this life change. The recession in 89 decided we would go from making fountains to other things. And we started doing rack cards with uh, uh, PP&D, which is a company that if you go into any motel or restaurant, there's rack cards in there. And we use Vermont Attractions Association because I chose not to live in the tourist area. I lived on Route 100 uh, in 1971, 1972, which is where all the tourists are. They run between Killington and Stowe and back and forth. And if you live on that corridor, you're smart and, and it's, it's the place you want to be if you want to sell things. If you move to Moortown, which was kind of a depressed logging community with farmers in it, it's not where all the people went. So we had to get people to kind of come over the mountain and that's how we, we did it for a number of years. So we opened a showroom in uh, 91 or 92 and, and that's where our, our studio is now. Uh, our house is there now. We've cut our expenses down by a huge amount. and. Um, now that's the inside of our, of our, our studio showroom. Uh, we had it in our house for 20 years and we just recently moved it out into the studio. So now I've lost workspace, but it's all in one building. Um, and I, just that whole thing was sophistication. This was in 1974 when I first moved to where I am now. The Silo Foundation is where the tower is. I had a craft booth like that out front in my build. And you know, it was sort of like being at a farmer's market, but nobody else being at the farmer's market. You know? uh, it doesn't quite work. You really kind of need other people to be coming into you. Uh, but people like to see a more sophisticated system. Same, same view there, that the tower's there now. We, we use packing materials from the tower to ship when we did all our shipping. Um, and that's what comes down into boxes. We would double box everything. We, we would shipped hundreds and hundreds of boxes and virtually had, had no breakage at all. Um, so all I'm really getting is there's really no one way, and I wish I knew what the answer was, but there is no one answer in how to make a living selling pots. I mean, it's, it's, it's a dodging, uh, it's something we're always kind of figuring out new methods for doing. Uh, I gave workshops for a few years as a way to kind of go out in the world and meet people and learn how other people did it and, and how people did it in England and New Zealand and Australia. And they all had different ones. Some of them were doing house parties, which actually worked out pretty well. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of the whole thing about being a potter, it's not about so much just you know, making good pots, it's that other end of, of making uh, the personal connection that you know, makes people want to own your work. So this is the very last little run here, and this is basically firing for surface effects, and that's really sort of where I'm at now. Uh, I've kind of moved away from, I still do some pit firing, I still do some raku firing, but wood firing has sort of become the surface effects I'm, I'm, I'm working toward. Um, I have a small raku kiln that I primarily do just white crackle glazes in, um, and those happen to be the cast forms, but I do throw some vase forms with that. Um, I'm burnishing, uh, greenware for those of you who know what pit firing is um, and putting them in a pit uh, with sawdust and copper sulfate and then stacking firewood on top and then burning that down. That's a photograph of the same pots that we piled in the pit before and then you're getting those flame patterns on the forms. Really low tech stuff. This is the stuff you can really do with you know, a very small studio and get very dramatic effects out of. Um, I still fire with gas. The kiln on the left I built in 75, tore it down in 2006 and rebuilt it. Uh, I use that primarily for bisque firing, but I'm also uh, doing uh, gas firing in it. So the batter bowls, which are underneath the table and a big part of what we do. Um, copper red glazes, I have much more success doing copper red glazes in gas kiln than I did in the wood kiln. I mean, wood kiln was erratic as hell and the gas kiln I can get pretty consistent copper reds out of. Um, so the logic of wood firing is illogical. I mean, I gotta just kind of say that. I mean, I, I, it's, it's great for schools, it's great for community events to do, but as a way you know, to find an audience, the audience keeps getting smaller and smaller when you get into more and more subtle effects. 
Um, so I built a wood kiln down by the road, uh, which is right on 116, and we used that for about, oh, I guess 10 years, burned that one out, but it gave me a sense of how fly ash can affect the pots. They're not, they don't have the drama that pit-fired pots do. Just before my last real apprentice, Brian worked with us for three years, left. He and I built this little uh, catenary arch kiln, which is a test kiln for me. It's not that it's a tiny, tiny kiln, but uh, I don't want to waste a lot of pots in my big kiln uh, without testing things out. So I work for very heavy salt effects. Uh, I look for heavy orange peel, um, and I, again, using wire cut surfaces and, and anything that changes the shape you know, will help uh, affect the way the, the uh, uh, salt patterns build up on the forms. Uh, this is the, the, the new large wood kiln. I'm in actually, I'm actually in the, the wood chamber there. Uh, and where I'm standing, there'll be another row of pots. So that, that kiln is like actually at that point half filled. And um, uh, this is now sort of becoming more like a once a year enterprise for us. We do one big firing a year, 12 to 1500 pots in that. I fire the small salt kiln maybe five or six times. We get maybe 50 pots each time out of that, mainly just testing things out. And I will be doing pit and raku just to keep things going. Just a couple quick shots. The next talk I do is going to be all about kilns, so I'm not going to show very much of it. But um, building the big kiln turned out to be a little bigger project than I had expected. Uh, I thought it was going to be like a three week. It turned out to be a two year project. Uh, but it should last me the rest of my life. And, you know, when the building, wood building that, that around it rots away, somebody can live in it. It's kind of like a brick house. Uh, so that's, that's the kiln that we're, we're firing in now. It burns about six cords of wood over about a 40 hour cycle. Um, and uh, we're stoking about every six minutes. And uh, again, I get relatively few of the effects that you see on the left, which, which I would call anagama where the pots are wadded on the sides and it's all about flashing. The pot on the right was fired in the second chamber and that's all about the salt texture. Um, other, other, again, uh, the salt texture is really what appeals to me greatly. And I'm trying to look for forms that are not quite so common. These are pilgrim vessels. And if you don't know what pilgrim vessels are, they're canteens, they were drinking vessels. That, uh, they're called pilgrim flasks. And if you look through history books, you'll see any numbers of different shapes of these forms. But uh, it's become sort of, I wouldn't say a trademark for me, but there's not a lot of other people doing them. So I kind of have a little niche for a while. Um, so mo mostly what I'm doing now is just refinement. And I don't know where the next 10 years is gonna be, but it's essentially refining forms more and more. Uh, I have the big kiln now, I, I, I'm not gonna tear it down. So for the next, as long as I can do it, I'll be, be wood firing and um, just uh, a night shot of the, of the big wood kiln uh, from about two years ago. And not to leave my wife Christine out, uh, even though I happen to be the only potter in the family, I'm the one that does all the throwing and trimming and firing the kilns or not, it's a two-person business. Without her running the showroom, without her talking to people, uh, remembering the names of people, uh, which is a, <laughs> something that I'm terrible at. I, I, I get faces good, but boy, names are, are way elusive of me. It's really a two-person business. I don't know how a one-person potter could really sort of do, you know, do it today the way that the two of us managed to do this together. So that is it. Uh, thank you. Sorry for the technical glitches earlier on. That was a surprise to me too. I was, um, but anybody have any questions? I'm here and um, I know I probably ran long on this one. And next week, next week, right? Next Thursday, I'll do one just on kilns and it's gonna be on brick making kilns. Uh, I've been lucky enough, I documented kilns in every country we've been to and a lot. Actually, if anybody around here is from Essex Junction, uh, there's a place called the Brickyard Condominiums. Uh, you know, if anybody was here in the early 70s, there were these beautiful big beehive kilns there. Uh, they tore them all down. I, I photographed them before they, they tore them down and that'll be part of my next firing. will be about not just potter's kilns, but all kinds of kilns that are used for firing high fire work. Um, and that, that's really sort of one of 
my personal interest is, is in both the architecture and uh, the in ingenuity that different potters use to build kilns. So, go. Uh, just a question to you. Uh, as a potter, yeah. you know, you're faced, as we all are, who also are potters, with the whole disparity between two-dimensional artists and pottery as a craft, quote unquote. How do you deal with that uh, over the course of time when you recognize that pottery is always not held to the, to the high esteem by our civilization? Talking about the art craft thing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, that, 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 that always comes up. I, 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 you know, when I was on the board of trustees in, in Frog Hollow back in the 80s, uh, we didn't allow sculpture in the studio. We didn't allow prints in the studio. Printmaking was not craft. So, you know, and now if you go to Frog Hollow, the wall space is, is a big money maker in, in the gallery there. And, it's, and, it's, and there's logical reasons for it. I mean, Sabre's field work is, is wonderfully well known. Um, but the, the other thing about most potters, uh, unless you go into a factory situation, which Simon Pierce does and other people do, is um, every time you do it, you're doing it again. I mean, you know, you can't run another one off to the lithograph press, or you can't, you know, copy another piece that way. That's, that's, the, that's what I find the most frustrating part of, of, uh, of, of that whole art craft, you know, you know area. Um, and, and things have really changed. I mean, there's so much more stuff coming in from overseas now, and it's so good. I mean, I, 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 I'm, I, I, I said last week, I'm not one of those people that says that pots coming in from China are like cheaply made and this or that. I mean, God, they're beautiful. And it kind of, you know, like, why the hell am I being a potter? I mean, I, I look at what's, what's going on in places and I go, this is beautiful stuff. But um, you've got to also soothe your, soothe your soul. And, and that's, you know, where it's at right now. And I, and, and I think more and more I, I'm finding less and less potters who are only potting. You know, most people have a teaching gig on the side, or they have a spouse that's working on the side, or they have some other thing going on. I was hired by a, a company over in New York, who I won't mention their names for, but they, they wanted to bring over a bunch of students to talk about what's the business of you know, being you know, a potter. And you know, I spent half my time talking to them about investing. <laughs> because, you know, because really, the money we made when we, were, when we had uh, more successful times is what we're going to end up living on later on. Because right now, we're in another recession. And you know, it's not coming back strong. And things are, 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 you know, are always changing. So it's really important to start early you know, with that whole, you know, what's going to happen. You know, when you're 23, it's one thing. When you're 33, it's another thing. By the time you're 53, if you're thinking about it, you're probably too late, you know. And uh, that's why we found an awful lot of our Potter friends who got to be that stage who just kicked into teaching gigs where, you know, they guaranteed something, you know, when it was all said and done. So I love, uh, in more recent ceramics, Monsieur Bernard Lavoie, who is a studio visit section where they ask the Potters what percentage of their time is spent making, what percentage is spent on business and maybe some numbers like how many pots do you think you make a year? I'd be, I'm just curious if you have any fun numbers like that for how you spend. You know, it, 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 it's an interesting question because you know, if if you asked me this 20 years ago, I would talk to more in tons of like 20 tons of clay, roughly a year. You know, and and, and now you know it's more like three tons of clay a year. Uh, so that's that's one way of looking at it. I mean, it doesn't mean much, but. Um, and I'm also, my cycle is very different than most potters. I mean, most potters will throw for a week, maybe two weeks, do a bisque firing. And if you know, if you're a potter, you know you can cram in usually three or four times as many pots in a bisque kiln as you can a glaze kiln. And then they glaze for a week or two. And then and, and the, the, the time they spend decorating is a lot of the time, or carving, is a lot of the time that they spend on the pot, not the, 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 actually the throwing process of it. Um, my cycle is really different. I, I throw for about four months of the year, 12 hours a day, you know, nonstop, bisque fire, and then just store all the bisque ware. And then when summer comes, I glaze and I fire outdoors. And by the end of my season, uh, when the last pots are coming out, it, it's already too late for that season because, you know, my, my next firing that comes out in November, I mean, that's for next summer. 
because I don't have any more customers really until so next summer's business. So I've had to learn to work on a different cycle. I'm not trying to dodge the question, but some years I'll make about 3,000 pots. Uh, when I had the water sculptors, you know, we probably only made, you know, 300 pots, but a whole different price range, you know, uh, and, that, and that's a big part of it. And if, Chris, are you the business manager? Do you, do you split? Do you divide up the making and the business part of making it work? Yeah, well, you know, people people come. It, we, when, when I was talking to Rob, who's not here, Rob Hunter, who's not here today, and Rob, Rob says, "What a what a sweetheart of a guy." Um, and and when he offered you know me to do this forty year retrospective here, we talked a lot about what it was, and he said it's really about a story. I mean, it's like you know, I, I wanted because I thought there'd be a lot of potters, and there are here tonight, I wanted to talk about techniques because that's what a lot of people like to talk about. But, um, but when it comes to actually selling work, and, and I you know, don't want to sound crass about it, but you're selling yourself as much as you're selling your work. And uh, when I had the water sculpture business and I was selling aquariums, you know, we were shipping these to people who we never heard of before, and they didn't know who we were at all. It was a novelty piece. It hung in their window and they sold it. They didn't care. They didn't care. It was made out of clay, you know. I went through a short period of time when I considered doing, going into plastic, you know. <laughs> and, and, yeah, you know uh, yeah, anybody seen the movie The Graduate? You know, it's like, you know, yeah, plastic. So, uh, and, and these would have been a much better pot out of plastic because I could not sell these in commercial installations because they were too vandalable. You know, I mean, somebody in a, in, a, in a mall, you know, a kid can come up and throw something against and break it, you know. Uh, plastic would have worked great, but, you know, uh, uh, Jim Schiedinger, who's an old friend of mine, always had this saying, he said, the difference between an artist and a potter was an artist would think of an idea and then look for the best material to make it out of, and a potter would think of an idea and then figure out some way to do it in clay. Uh, you know, and I, I'm a potter, you know. So, I, you know, that's where I keep ending up with. It keeps getting made up out of clay. Um, In your travels, are there countries that really value 40-year commitment to work uh, and, and revere that versus other cultures? Well, I, I haven't been to Japan, um, and that, that's certainly, obviously, for anybody who knows much about clay, that's the place where potters and brain surgeons are sort of, you know, more, you know they're, they're very well respected there. Um, but I also have been to New Zealand a fair amount. I first went there in 1981, and we've been back, I think, five times. And I've seen tremendous changes in New Zealand from, uh, it's not that they don't respect clay there, but that's one of those countries where things have changed so much. It was between imports coming in and, you know, local potters not being able to make it anymore. Uh, we have a, a huge number of friends in New Zealand who have switched over to becoming a part-time bed and breakfast and pottery, uh, as opposed to just doing it straight out. Um, and the other, the other thing, I, again, I mentioned that the last, I, I don't want to always repeat myself, but the other thing that uh, different about the US, and I won't get into politics and who I'm going to vote for, Obama, uh, who I'm going to vote for, but, uh, but the reality is, you know, our, our culture is set up so much differently. Like when I would be in, in, in England and I talked to, to potters there about, you know, um, you, know, I was, you know, I was just ending my water sculpture business when I first gave a workshop there in 1998. And I, and I said to them, you know, the first $20,000 worth of pots I sell a year pays for my health insurance. Because, you know, for the $12,000 I need to spend on health insurance, I have to gross 20. And that's, that's no pay for me yet. And now we're starting here. And a lot of the potters who were real potters were saying, you know, we make a good living on 35 grand a year here. I mean, you know, you know because they don't have that, that aspect to, to deal with. Uh, so every culture is a little different and, uh, and it's changing even in New Zealand. We, in the last couple of times we were in New Zealand, we we're finding that, you know, the healthcare burden there is starting to overwhelm people and, you know, they're actually starting to have to buy some insurance on the side. And so, you know. It's, it's a tough one to go. I know you've... Yeah, I, um, I, was, I was wondering in terms of uh, your business model has changed quite a bit from uh, advertising your work uh, in the, you know, the, the cards and in, in the uh, catalogs. Uh, where does uh, the internet fit into your business model now? And if, if you were uh, in a different place in your career, where do you think it would be? 
uh, it depends on what age meaning, I would be. Meaning, <laughs> if, you, if you were uh, sort of starting up. Yeah. Um, well, I, I didn't even mention it in here, but the internet yeah. is an amazing, I mean, it, it's an amazing and also daunting kind of place to be in. Uh, we had an early web presence. Uh, we had a website in 1998 when most people didn't have, I mean, AOL was just coming along and he had dial up and, you know, uh, but we were doing a website for business to business because that color catalog cost us, uh, and I, got, I throw numbers out at you only because so many people don't and you don't know what the hell they're talking about if you don't. But back in, uh, I guess it was like 98, back around 1998 when we were printing those catalogs out, it was costing us about $30,000 a year to print the catalog mail the catalog. We had like $4,000 a year in postage stamps that we'd mail these things out in. And uh, so you have all these other kind of costs that exhibit that, that were expensive then. You know, color separations, printing costs were all different now. I, in some respects, I think this is the best of times because everybody has a computer and most people are pretty darn good at Photoshop. Not that you want your work to look better than it really is, but it doesn't have to look worse than it did, which it oftentimes <laughs> did with, with, with prints or with, with slides or with uh, you know, film before. Um, and right now, we're about 10% of our gross is coming in from the web. Um, and oh, from, your own website. from our own website. And our own website, if you've never been to it, um, and you have about a week uh, to spend, <laughs> uh, it's about 400 pages long. Now, you won't see all 400 pages, but, but if you dig into it, we have layers of stuff. So people can find information and find information. And the reason we do this, and I'm not, I'm not a techie. I'm trying to be, but I'm not a techie. But we find out that we come up much higher on search engines if we have more content, if we're not just pages of selling pots, but if we have information about kilns, you know, if we have information about potters around the world, if we have information about clays and tools and equipment. Uh, consequently, we do get a lot of emails every week asking some questions that I wish I didn't have to answer, uh, you know, about, you know, I have this alpine wheel and I'm missing, you know, because I, you know, so, so that, and then I try to be kind enough to answer that. But, but I'll give you one quick sideline on how the, how the internet would, has really been interesting to us. Uh, I was communicating with a guy in Cuba this past winter. And he emailed me, and he, and he must have Googled kilns. And we come up high, if you Google pottery kilns, I mean, other than Bailey and the people who sell kilns, we come up pretty high on search engines that way. And this fellow wrote to me uh, an email, and he said, uh, you know, I need to, I, I'm interested in building a wood kiln. Uh, we have this, this noxious brush here in, in Cuba that we need to burn anyway, and it's free. And, uh, and I have clay source not too far from me. Uh, can you give me some, some ideas on what kind of kiln to build? That's kind of a general question, you know, it's like, you know. Uh, but, you know, I wrote back to him, for, you know, I, I happened to be in Cuba before Castro took over. So I was like nine years old at the time, but, but it kind of, I was kind of piqued my interest. So, so I wrote back to the guy and, and his syntax was really good. I get a lot of stuff from Africa where pot, people are asking how to build kilns to make bricks. And these, these aren't bogus things like, you know, $20 million if you'll send me five. It's, you know, these are real people who want, you know, who want to know how to build a brick making kiln because they want to make bricks for their community. And usually the syntax is me kiln want build, make brick for house, no, you know. Uh, and this guy in Cuba was like, it's like talking to anybody, it was like, you know, on the email was just perfect. So we emailed back and forth three or four times. And the gist of the whole story was, um, First of all, he taught English. He's Cuban, but he taught English, so his English was good. And it turns out that he was not a potter at all. He, he was a teacher, but he got paid so little as a teacher that he was making wine. And he was looking for wine containers. And there was not an accessibility for wine containers there. But he had clay on his land, and he had all this brush to burn. So he wanted to build a kiln he wanted, first of all, he wanted to make bottles to put <laughs> wine in, and then he was looking for a cheap way to fire them. And it's like, well, is this a convoluted way of thinking? I, I don't ever heard of it. But that's the kind of stuff that the World Wide Web, you know, does for us. And, we, and a lot of the people that we sell to on the web um, tend to buy nicer pots. I mean, we kind of thought we'd be selling a lot of batter bowls and our regular stuff, but uh, more often than not, it's been someone who actually, actually may not even know a lot about clay, but they go to our website and they 
you know, read about what we're talking about in there, and, they, and they'll say, uh, well, actually, we sold one to a guy in England, like this last winter, I guess it was, who had uh, a uh, potter friend who he knew collected jugs. And I ended up, you know, he, he found my website and he said, you know, looks like you know what you're doing. Why don't you, uh, you know, send me one of your jugs? And it was a couple hundred dollars for a jug. And you know, if you go to J Jugtown or to Seagrove, you know, you can buy great jugs down there for 40 bucks, you know. <laughs> so, but, you know, he, he felt like there was um, the story behind the pot, you know, is what made it work. And that's what we work on a lot. I mean, a lot of my time is actually spent, you know, you know and we, we update our website every month, not every page. But, you know, every, every month you'll see the opening page is different with different photographs. Uh, it, it's all the kind of stuff that Google, you know, you know recognizes as being uh, important. So that's where I see it going. I don't know if it will or not. And as I get older and I'm really, I'm, I'm done with craft fairs. So I, I can't do them anymore. And we've had a retail shop now for over 20 years. And I'm not saying we're done with it, but, but it, you know, it, it, you lose privacy, you know, when you live above the corner store. And um, so we're, you know, the, the web kind of seems good. You know, you put it in a box, you mail it. Um, so. So it's. Joe, sure, go ahead. Sorry. Um, you just talked about how your website is so deep with information, and I know it's not just to make you pop up on the search engines, but it's to connect to all of these other people out there who are trying to do this stuff too. And um, I'm married to a potter, and so and I know lots about you because of um, how much you have contributed to potters all over the state with potlucks and visits and talks and all of that. Vermont has more potters per capita than any other state, probably. Why? <laughs> <laughs> because our population is so freaking low. <laughs> but, but yeah, you're right. There, there, there are a lot of people up here who are potters. So this balance between you know training, educating, and inspiring other potters as artists, so you're in a community of potters. Um, that essentially could be competition for you as well, but have you seen it over the 40 years just raise up? No, you know, it, exactly, it's really the exact opposite. Yeah. Uh, I think the more potters that there are here, I mean, I, I hear this from my friends in, in uh, Seagrove, you know what Seagrove is? Anybody knows? Seagrove, North Carolina is this little pottery mecca, uh, and, and, it ha and there's a long history for that, which is, bizarre to get into, but, but there's a lot of pot buyers down there. I mean, people, buses of people go down and they visit, there's like, I forget the number, but there's like a 80 potters within 30 miles of each other. So they feed off of each other. You know, these buses come and they, you know, are going back and forth between places. Now, obviously, if your work is just like the guy down the road, you're, you're kind of in trouble. Um, but if you're doing crystal and glazes and nobody else is, you know, it, it may or may not give you an edge. Uh, and, and the same thing happens to us. We oftentimes have customers come to our studio and they walk in and, you know, we, you know, we, we try to be really, I mean, we really do try to, we love people. I mean, uh, and we don't see them very often actually. So, so, so I mean, I, I go a week without leaving my property sometimes. So, uh, so we, we generally really enjoy people when there's not too many coming through. So we enjoy chatting with folks and people will walk in and, and they'll see the wood fired work and they'll go, you know, do you have anything with a maple leaf on it, you know? <laughs> and, and, and I'm not, a, I'm not like, that doesn't offend me, but I know people who do the pots, you know? Uh, a blue iris, I'm looking for a blue iris that, that goes with a Delft wear that we, you know, Judith Bryant lives six miles from here, go see her, you know? And, and the same thing happens with them. I mean, people stop in Judith Bryant's and they say, well, I, I like your work, but I'm kind of looking for some wood-fired pots. I've heard a lot about them, don't know much. Um, and sometimes that's good because they come down to buy pots, but sometimes they come down to talk pots, which is unfortunate because I like to talk pots and that, that blows off that day. Uh, but, uh, but, but, but generally, you know, we, we, you know I, I've rarely met a potter that you know, wasn't being supportive of other potters within their community. Um. Michelle. What I really appreciate your implication is not only that, but on your web page, there is a, there is a really special uh, place where potters can meet each other through your B&B 
Oh, yeah. So yeah, it's yeah. really, really important. We met some, through this, we met some potters. Oh, you stayed think? with potters. Yeah. Amazing, yeah. yes. Did you stay with, um, oh, um, who wrote the introduction to our book? Um, Kevin Crow. Did you stay with Kevin Crow? Yeah. Yeah, there's a book, there's a booklet here that Frog Hollow did uh, on, on, on this. And Kevin Crow was a potter friend of mine in Virginia. Uh, and and he's, he's, we're kindred souls. I mean, uh, we haven't known each other that long, but we just, you know, we've, we've had a similar kind of a life and uh, feel a sense of, I, I, you know, we're all old hippies. I mean, we're, you know, anybody who's over 60, you know, you know, and, and, you know, we're sort of that generation that you all felt like you're part of the community. So I, I started a bed and breakfast program. Actually, uh, a, a fellow by the name of Jerry Williams, who is now much older, and he started a magazine called Studio Potter Magazine. But he asked me about 22 years ago uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to get together a way for potters to connect with each other, pre-internet. This is really pre-internet, and his concept was, potters guilds all around would connect with each other and then the information would be disseminated to the potters guilds and then they could disseminate it to their, their members so there wouldn't be so much mailing and all that kind of stuff going on and uh, I, you know, I started the, the, the B&B program with like five potters you know we all know each other we weren't going to stay at each other's houses uh, and and it started to grow over the years uh, I think there's 16 countries now uh, about 800 potters in it and uh, Michelle stayed with Potters. You've had Potters. We've stayed with yes, you. We uh, had Potters from Australia, you know. So uh, I found that absolutely amazing. Thank you very and, much. And it's, and it's you know, it's like there, you know, you're, you're visiting people in another country who have the same interest you have. And, and if you're and if you're a Potter, you probably don't have much money anyway. So it's really you know. And, and the whole thing with the Potter being beer, because there's no money exchange. The whole thing is it's it's if you know if you're a part of the program, if you're in the B&B program. You have the, you know, uh, you have the right to, to write to anybody else who's in the program if you're traveling, and they ask if you can, you know, to stay with them, or, yeah. and if you can't, oftentimes they'll say, listen, we can't. My mom's stem to stay with us, but there's some partners down the road we'd like to introduce you to and come over for dinner. So it can, it's just a networking device. The whole web has changed since then, to Michelle, though, as you know. I mean, I, we were, we, this was pre-net, and I, now it is on the, on the internet, and it works, and. We have maybe five or six new potters a month joining, but unfortunately, I haven't figured out a way to update it. And uh, who we were talking about Otto and Vivica. Otto and Vivica were part of it. And there was a point where, and you know, Otto and Vivica Heino, if anybody who knows who they are, they were, you know, <laughs> yeah, they were multi multi millionaires as potters uh, from from very bizarre reasons. But partly because of Jerry Williams, you know, and he they joined the B and B program, and I actually knew potters who stayed with them. I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, what a place to stay, huh? Guy has two Bentleys, you know. Guy, you know, this guy, this guy did real well. He invented a glaze that was unknown. It was, an, it was a Chinese glaze. It was a Chinese. Uh, it was, no, it was Japanese Shinto. It was a yellow Shinto glaze. It was a yellow Shinto that was unheard of. It was known, and then lost in time. And somehow he figured it out, and he he was he made, he made millions, millions of dollars on, on this stuff. So. But he's passed on now. Two years ago. So, but yeah, thank you, Michelle. Thank That's you. yeah, yeah. So, well, all set. Well, thanks so much. Appreciate it. <laughs>